Okay, we're back. We're live. It's five o'clock on a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. The handsome young man on the screen on the right side is Mitch Ewan. Uh, he's my co-host here on Energy 808, the cutting edge. And the very handsome young man on the left side is Richard Ha. Uh, hi, Richard. Formerly a farmer and now a kind of altruist, uh, an altruist renewable energy person on the Big Island and more. A man with vision, right, Richard? Uh, I kind of like to describe it as common sense, actually. <laughs> Maybe there's no difference. <laughs> Keep it simple. <laughs> <laughs> so, Mitch, you have a handle on what's uh, what we're going to do here today. Can you give us the scope of the show? Maybe your thoughts about who Richard Ha really is? Yeah, well, we're going to talk about geothermal power, which is uh, both my favorite and Richard's favorite topic. And uh, more than just the power part, but all the other things that uh, we can use that uh, resource for. Uh, Richard is a entrepreneur and a real champion of renewable energy. And he's the go-to guy when people want to start big projects. He's a big project guy and doesn't matter what it is, whether growing pot legally or running your farm and uh, educating us all on energy and, and why we have to uh, get off oil as, uh, as he uh, was enlightened. I mean, that's why you're not farming anymore, right, Richard? It's because the cost of energy was going up and up and uh, you projected that and uh, you were proactive and uh, shut your business down in an orderly way so that your employees could all have a gentle landing and go to other jobs, which is, the kind of guy Richard is. He's a really kind hearted, but great businessman who takes action when it has to be taken. So, wow, Richard, any rebuttal on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where to start here. <laughs> but, you know, um, Mitch is right. We shut the farm down mainly because we had to uh, decide whether or not to reinvest. Because, you know, the, the facilities would last about 20 years. So we did the numbers and it wouldn't come out. So just about that time, some of the folks down on the coast, the Armaco coast, asked me if uh, I would be willing to uh, work with them about uh, a, a new project they had, which was uh, cannabis, legal, you know, med medicinal cannabis. And I said, yeah, sure. I, I'm interested, but I got to go talk to my workers first. And then... Uh, so I did, and I asked the, the, the workers, and I asked them if uh, anybody would be interested in working for a cannabis company. And everybody was great, rose their hand, raised their hand. <laughs> <laughs> Gee, what a surprise. <laughs> That's why they had a gentle landing. They just smoothed <laughs> down. They didn't even know they landed yet. <laughs> you know, and we were kind of lucky because that at that time, the economy was doing really well. No, I mean, like we're talking about 2% uh, unemployment rate, something like that. So people had an option to do whatever they wanted to do because uh, 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 the economic climate was good. But uh, for the folks that came to ask me whether I would participate, I, I told them uh, only for four years, because I figured in four years they could get up and running and then I could go back to doing the stuff I like to do. Um, and in three years, they were able to, to get it done. But what I told them the conditions were was, number one, my workers would have first shot at the jobs. Number two, the folks that live in the community would have to feel better. In other words, we'd have to put in cameras to watch the roads, et cetera, et cetera. And then the third one was, I told them I'd have to have a real job and not just be a cartoon caricature on a stick. So they said, yeah, and okay. So, so that's what happened. And then now they're on their way. And here we are talking about the stuff. Right? Yeah, well, it's a good thing. You you have a real job, right? I, I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm just kind of losing. This is for fun, actually. I know that. So, so <laughs> and I admire you very greatly for it, Richard. So geothermal, you got involved in geothermal. Can you talk about why and how and what you're view of it is right now these days? Yeah, you know, when geothermal started back in the original, I wasn't paying attention because we were farming bananas then. When only recently I started to pay attention. But uh, 
it, it, and the attention really, really uh, focused during this last eruption. And so, and, and I know Don Thomas, the, the um, geologist, pretty well. So, so I asked him a whole bunch of questions. As it, as it turns out, you, you know, when, when the, before the, the, the eruption started, the, they were on the high ground. After the eruption, you know, finished up, and, and now the lava lifted so high that they're no longer on the real high ground. The next time an eruption comes around, it could uh, threaten them pretty, pretty badly. So that's why we were thinking of looking at uh, alternative locations on this island. You know, I mean, there's a uh, geothermal uh, possibility. We could find volcanoes on this island. And what we should do is, is uh, evaluate them all. We should have all the data uh, letting us know how much and where and stuff like that. Well, let's take, let's take a moment and talk about that. Certainly, the location you look at ought to have geothermal underneath. That's, that's got to be, you know, consideration number one. And, and it sounds like it ought not to be in a rift zone um, or in a zone where it could be inundated. Uh, you know, otherwise, you, you, know, you, you would not have achieved any benefit from um, learning about PTV. Um, but what else? So what else? Um, what other characteristics would you be looking for if you're looking for a location to build a, a second geothermal facility on the Big Island? Well, I, I, I think pretty sure you don't really want to be close, uh, very close to the uh, population. And then after that, you start to look at other things like how far are you from the main power line? How much would it cost to hook up there? Uh, what's the chances of how fast will the, the okay, let's say you're on Mauna Loa, how fast will it come down the slope and how much time do you have? And can you mitigate that? Uh, there, and there are different places, you know, like Kuala Lai, the uh, Kuala Mountain, there's sure different places we have to uh, any test here. Uh, we've done a lot of tests around the slopes of Mauna Kea. And unofficially, Don Thomas thinks that there's as much uh, heat under Mauna uh, Mount Kea as the entire East Rift. So there's a lot of, a lot of geothermal heat. And, and we, we went to the Philippines too. And during, we visited uh, a geothermal plant that last erupted on a, on a, on a mountain uh, 100,000 years ago. And Mauna Kea erupted last 4,000 years ago. So it common sense here yeah, to ask, hey, what about Mauna Kea? You get geothermal underneath there or what? <laughs> and it, as it turns out, that's what Don folks have found, yeah. Mm. Well, he's a great guy. Shout out to Don Thomas. Um, so you also went to Reykjavik, no, in Iceland? Yeah, yeah. What'd you learn there? Um, the first thing I learned was if you don't pay attention, you freeze to death. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very important lesson. <laughs> it is. You know, so they look at it differently than we do. We're over here with the La Hala hat and stuff like that. Yeah. They're over there looking all around and trying to figure out how to make this thing work to their best advantage. That's why they have that uh, uh, blue lagoon where people just go. So so many people go up there and take advantage of it, and they they get money back into the economy. So like that, yeah. Yeah, they jump in the hot water, huh? Oh yeah, really nice. And you know what I found out? So the first time I went in the water, I went, oh man, it's gonna. It's not that really deep, you know, I, I'm kind of short, so I have to crouch down. Because when you crouch down, only above your ears get cold. <laughs> really cold. <laughs> yeah, right. well, there's a key lesson that you obviously failed to learn, Richard, uh, which is go in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> not when all that white stuff is on the ground. That's weird. You don't want to do that. And plus, it's the uh, land of the midnight sun almost. I mean, the sun hardly ever comes up in the winter. So, uh, you know, like, uh, but, but of course, in the summer, it hardly ever sets. So it really throws your body clock off. I mean, yeah. I used to be, uh, I used to work in Scotland and uh, just north of Glasgow. And like in August, it's like 
at 11 o'clock at night, it looks like four o'clock in the afternoon anywhere else. And it's like, gee, how do you ever get to sleep? You know, and the bars are still open and it's like, wow, really tough. But in the winter, it's miserable because it's like you get about two hours of sun. Yeah, and, that's uh, Reykjavik, all right. Yeah. So, so Richard, you know, how, how do you mediate against what happened in the eruption? I mean, are there lessons that uh, PGV or we in general uh, have learned because of what happened in the eruption? I, I, I'm not so sure I, I follow. Well, you, you know, it was, it was uh, devastating for PGV. The, oh, the era. And, um, you know, I mean, I mean ideally, um, you, what you would do is build a kind of modular facility where if it erupts again, you just lift it up and carry it down the road and put it somewhere else and you don't, you don't lose a whole lot of equipment um, you know, and investment in the, in the process. Is, is that possible on some scale? I'm not so sure what, what more they could do because they set it up so, so that they could just fill it up with, with the cinder and the lava covered it. They just wait until it hardened and come back and clean it up, pull the cinder out, and they're back in business. So they were already predicting some yeah. kind of eruption going forward, and, and it didn't come to them as a surprise. True. Yeah. 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 No, I mean, they, they engineered that beautifully. I mean, I, one of the tours I had, they, you know, the wellheads were buried like uh, 20 feet under in these big concrete encasements, and they had these big steel plates that they could put over top of it, they disconnect all the top top level plumbing off of the top side, I think they call it. And then they just put the plate over and they know exactly what the coordinates are from GPS. And that's exactly the way it works. It's like, you know, and they built most of their equipment on the hill. And so it filled in and they went cool. Like Richard said, they just went in to, to the spot and drilled down and found it. And they, they got up going pretty fast, actually. I mean, these, are, these guys are really pros. I mean, uh, Ormat, it's an American company. It was originally an Israeli company. The guy was an Israeli engineer, as I remember. I met him once. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, uh, now that I think they're in Nevada, and uh, they have, but they have facilities. Okay. And they have facilities all over the world. Wherever there's geothermal, there's Ormat. Uh, they're one yeah. of the biggest geothermal companies in the world. Yeah. Um, and so they they have an engineering background, as you say, and the engineering is what counts on this. Right. Yeah, they have it all figured out pretty very well, actually. So in your mind's eye, Richard, um, if we have a second location or a third location, whatever, and let's assume for this discussion, it's on Hawaii Island, um, would it be Ormat or is there some other company that could or should do it? You know, it, it would be open to anybody. Let, let's say uh, Eco uh, issued an RFP. Anybody who's interested, any geothermal company could participate. So uh, we're indifferent as to who will do it. Although I got to say about uh, Ormat from what I've seen, they're very flexible. They're, they're willing to do um, build and own it build and sell it back to you. There's all kinds of different possibilities. You just got to see what it is you want to do. And they're, they're probably willing to do it. Well, let's talk about the, you know, the, the challenges. One, one challenge, of course, is the possibility of another eruption. And it's not so much the loss of the capital investment I'm talking about. It's, it's the fact that it's going to be offline for a while while they fix it up. <clears throat> That's one thing. The other thing is, you know, you have a an historic cultural, what do you want to call it, concern um, about about geothermal on a big island, which I, you know, I don't, I don't think that's scientifically based at all. But um, there are people who would oppose it on that basis alone, and so um, you don't have that with solar, you don't have that with wind. Um, how, how do you get around that? Uh, how do you answer the fellow who says, "Why don't we just do solar and pave the big island with solar"? Yeah, you know, uh, the way th that Sustainable Energy Hawaii looks at it is we look at the situation like we're somebody's ancestor. And then we ask our, the question, what can we do for future generations? 
50, 100 years from now. And that's our focus. When you, when you, when you discuss it like that, anybody who has a discussion or who wants to discuss or argue, we can bring up that, that point of view and ask them, well, where do you think we should be? And what should we do? Then, then all of a sudden, we all want to say date. Oh, what what should the kit bag have? You know, what what should the portfolio for the big big island is different, right? It's different, it's unique. It has more potential energy resources than any other place in the state. Um, what kind of a inventory? What kind of a portfolio should it have? Knowing what we know, okay, if you think of, take it from a common sense point of view, if you just kind of look around and ask yourself, okay, what have we what have we got? Where do we want to go? So you look around at the energy sources, of course you have wind and solar and uh, hydro and stuff like that. But we were 1% of the world fortunate enough to have geothermal. So we have that. Now, what's going on in the world? If you look around, you see there are a whole bunch of uh, countries moving toward hydrogen. And if you think about hydrogen, you ask yourself, okay, what's the situation with hydrogen? Well, on the mainland, it's uh, 90 something percent of the hydrogen that's produced is produced from natural gas. Natural gas is a finite resource. Finite resource means that it'll deplete sooner or later. We don't know exactly how soon. It means the price will go up. On the other hand, geothermal, we won't have to pay a penny for the uh, 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 extra penny for the heat. I should mention that we don't have to go and look for it. Uh, rare earth minerals in foreign countries and transport it all the way to Hawaii. And then 20 years later, take it all down and figure out, try to figure out what you're going to do with the rubbish. Mm -hmm. Then do it all over again. You don't have to do any of that. You have to do the basic minimum, but it, it just comes in. You have, so, you have let, me, let me ask to say, add one more thing. Now, there's only so much that we can uh, bring online for the island because there are so many people using the electricity. But we want to prepare for the time when hydrogen comes on board. So what we really need to do is we need to start to explore so that we're ready when uh, people offer us an RFP. We're not ready now. We, don't, we, we haven't done any, any uh, real research yet. Uh, the Hawaii Groundwater Research, uh, Geothermal Resource Center is a vastly underused uh, organization there at, uh, on, at UH Manoa. It's, it's, all, it's all Mitch can do to stop jump, from jumping in on this. Uh, <laughs> I, this is his bailiwick. I mean, he was yeah. there trying to make hydrogen out of, out of Pune a long time ago. Can you talk about it, Mitch? Oh uh, yeah, so our, our first site uh, was going to be at uh, Puna Geothermal Plant, and they very kindly uh, welcomed us in. Uh, we went through the full environmental assessment process, and uh, it took us five years to go through all the, uh, you know, jump through all the hoops that we had to go to to get permitting in place. But uh, the thing I love about geothermal is that it's twenty four seven. You know, it's just nonstop. And like uh, Richard tells us, it's good for the next half a million years, at least. And so uh, the best economy of using your electrolyzer is if it can work 24 seven, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as opposed to wind and solar. Wind, solar is only good for five and a half hours. So what do you do with the rest, uh, you know, the 20, uh, the 19 and a half hours that you're not using your electrolyzer, it just sits there. And uh, you're still shelling out money to the uh, banks who loan you the money to uh, pay for it. And the same with wind. I mean, a really good wind resource is like 35% utility factor, meaning that wind blows 35% of the time, but it's not blowing full blast all the time either. It's going up and down. And so once again, you're, you're not using the best, uh, you're not using the, what they call capital utilization of your asset. It's sitting there dormant when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. Whereas with the, with the geothermal plant, it's steady state nonstop all the time. And uh, the geothermal plant likes electrolyzers because electrolyzers like to run steady state. 
you don't have to ramp the, uh, the geothermal plant up and down, which is basically a, a steam engine. And uh, steam engines don't like to be ramped up and down because of thermal stresses and all that kind of stuff. So it's the perfect marriage between the resource and making your hydrogen. And, uh, and then, you know, there's all sorts of things we can do with the hydrogen. Um, I mean, what I would like to do is liquefy it uh, on the site. They make liquid hydrogen as opposed to keeping it as a gas. And that way we can export it. And we can export it to Oahu because Oahu needs the energy, but they don't have the land mass or the resources to make enough to be self-sustaining. They're always gonna to have to import energy. I don't care what anybody says. I mean, you know, I think they've maxed out the number of wind turbines they can put up because everybody sees how huge they are and they hate them and they're right on top of the community. Uh, so that's not gonna work. And, you know, there's only so much flat land to put your PV panels down. So uh, it makes a lot more sense, in my opinion, to export liquid hydrogen from the Big Island over to Oahu, which is basically um, exporting energy. And if you look at hydrogen, it's like 10 times more energy uh, than on a transmission line, an electrical transmission line. So you're exporting a lot of energy, and that's what we're trying to do. So maybe well, I've been, I've been, lot, but that's how I feel about, and, and you're right about diversifying the supply. We need to get out there and drill and prospect for new sites so that if one, uh, we have one eruption on one side of the island, the other side still being able to produce. That's, that's common sense, as Richard uh, says. Well, I, I've been thinking about these, these tanks. Um, that I guess it was Stan Osman showed me these tanks uh, in HCAT. <clears throat> they're about mm, eight feet long. They're about 18 inches in diameter. Um, they have a head on one end where you can put the gas or I suppose the, the, the liquid hydrogen in there and you can put it on a, on a boat. You can put it on a boat and you can deliver that from Pune um, to Oahu. Um, okay, so we, we've had a we've had a way to create the hydrogen out of the geothermal for a long time. I mean, the, the current iteration of ORMAT at, at Pune has been since the late '90s, um, and that technology with the tanks has existed all that time. And my question to you guys is, why hasn't this happened already? You know, it's it's a ticklish situation because of take uh, Kiko, for example. They when they're ready, they'll just announce that they're ready to accept more geothermal. But you know, there's we need to have this conversation with the Hawaiian community because they're sensitive for various different reasons. So and and that's what's going on. That's what we're doing right now. Um, and and I'm I'm pretty optimistic. Um, that we, we actually see things the same way. You know, take, take for example, uh, Kumulipo. You know, if you think about the Kumulipo, like, like me, I didn't have any idea what was going on until about you know, four or four months ago or something like that. I was more focused on what was taking place on the mainland with the uh, uh, Nate Hagens and Charlie Hall and those folks, and they, they, they showed how uh, uh, energy is everything. And I, I just focused there. And when I came back and I started looking at uh, what anti poor guys were saying, it dawned on me one day that uh, they were talking, the Hawaiians were successful a thousand years with a physical science, ecology kind of economic system. Then, they, then of course, they had the culture to make sure that it worked under the system, under that system. It lasted for a thousand years and they were very successful in basically you know, I'm, I'm going to this class, Halau uh, Ohia, taught by Kekuhi Kanahili. And, and basically what it is, is they're teaching us how to look at living things, you know, like the ecology yeah, of, of land and living things in the ocean. So, so when, when you teach people to appreciate your surrounding, you don't end up with externalities because you're very careful about uh, making sure that everything is in balance. And that is a really huge thing that, and then when that occurred to me, I, I went back and said, holy smokes. So I talked to Nate Higgins, and Nate Higgins is very well aware 
of what the Hawaiians bring to this discussion. It's the thousand years we're talking about, how to survive for a thousand years. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, Aloha has a lot to do with it. Uh, your mental uh, point of view has a lot to do with how you approach. Uh, uh, and, and, and the reason this is important is because you know, like Kalepa Baibayan, he was a master navigator at the University of Hawaii Hilo. When I look at him, I see a thousand years of Hawaii's history in him because he's a master navigator. But because he was so uh, focused on science, I look at him as the next thousand years in the future. So I, I, I'm a strong supporter of, of Aleppo, of this vision. Well, suppose, suppose you were able to negotiate a complete acceptance of the notion of geothermal with the Native Hawaiian community on the Big Island. Now, that would be, you know, that would be quite something. But if I tell you the truth, you know, Richard, you could do that. I believe you could do that. So let's assume you do it. What are the steps to follow? Um, a, get uh, Puna operating at maybe a higher level. I think it was limited to like 38 megawatts up till now. Um, to get it to 50 or 100, maybe even. Because as you say, it's got plenty of energy in there, energy to last for thousands of years. Um, we could go much higher. It could take a, a larger burden of whatever the demand is on the Big Island. Um, and secondly, um, you know, what, what would you do? What, what would you have to do to meet the bureaucratic challenge, you know, the regulatory challenge and get it started? What's the pathway? Yeah, well, the first thing we got to do is have a story that we can tell to the robot slipper folks. But they don't really care. Uh, uh, what, what I should say is this. They are under so much pressure. They cannot take too much more. So we have got to show them that what, we, that what we're doing is going to increase and improve the quality of life of them, and, and not more so than them future generation. So if you can visualize what 50 years will look like, well, I can tell you this, 50 years from now, fossil fuel, it is going to be real expensive. And if we didn't have it, we are at the end of the supply chain, we'd be in big trouble. Mm. So, so if we have geothermal, and if we do something like the culture center about the cloud, and then if you uh, uh, first, that are looking at, at that, you know, looking into the heavens, they're going to be willing to pay a lot more. And, and that translates into value for what the local people produce. It, it translates into a better economy, less unemployment, more and more taking care of your health and, and uh, that kind of thing. So generally that's uh, how you do it. You know, you just gotta, Nate has some ideas, and we're going to start to bring that out and see if we can pull people together. But um, we're kind of early stages in, in trying to figure out something. But that's, that's pretty much what I think we got to do. Well, what, you know, what about the uh, interests, Mitch, uh, in, in hydrogen? In other words, what I'm thinking of is one of, one of the possibilities here is to have ORMAT or whoever develops a hydrogen facility, um, either the existing one or a, a second one or a third one, what have you, um, that, that, that company would enter into some kind of partnership um, uh, you know, on, the, on the connection um, between geothermal and hydrogen so that uh, they were both in it somehow and they were both making a buck off putting it in those tanks and exporting it uh, using those big islands or exporting it to Oahu or elsewhere. In other words, it would be it would be a, a partnership kind of arrangement. Wouldn't that be a way to raise the capital, raise the interest, raise the political will? Yeah, there's several ways you could do that, but yeah, I, I, I exactly understand what you're trying to say. Because the last thing we want to have happen is have foreign investors come in and extract all the value and take it offshore. That ain't going to happen. But it's, a, it's basically a financial or a business arrangement with them. I mean, from 
Puna geothermal from Ormat's point of view, they produce electrons and the hydrogen people produce molecules. And, uh, you know, we need to have inexpensive uh, electrons to produce inexpensive hydrogen. So it's a, it's a very good, it's a natural fit. And, uh, you know, they, they, they don't necessarily want to make the hydrogen themselves. I mean, their expertise is in making the electron. And uh, so that's, and then we just have to make sure that it's a Hawaii, like Richard said, it's a Hawaii company that comes in to make the hydrogen. So we keep the money in the local economy. That's very important. It's like uh, what I'm trying to do with the buses. Instead of exporting our capital and buying the bus already made on the mainland, is to bring over a kit and assemble it here so that the, you know, the local workforce can have a job and use our capital more uh, to our own advantage rather than a company sitting on the mainland. And we do the same thing with hydrogen and all the other things that fall out of it. So that's how we, that's how we do it. And we build all the infrastructure that we need to export the hydrogen to the, the uh, Oahu. For example, uh, you know, various transportation methods, make sure we try to make everything here as much as we can. And, and I wanted to add opportunity. Oh, sorry. I, I wanted to add one more thing, and that is, you know, when we look at uh, eco and, and see if they, how they fit in this picture, they do fit very, you know, it, it, it it's, depends on how they, they, they uh, 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 proceed into the future. But I, I, I'm not discounting the fact that they could be uh, running the grid and everything in a in a in a economical way and still benefit all of us. That's possible. It's it, I, I'm not saying that we just have to invent something else and cut them out or anything like that. It it what makes the most sense. What what are the pluses and minuses? Yeah. Well, I want to add one other thought. To see what you think about it. Uh, one of the issues on the Big Island, and I've had discussions with Helco about this. Um, so that's why I'm aware of it. Is that when you when you put a cable down from a remote power source um, to a community um, that's using the, you know, the demand community, if you will, um, it's expensive and, and it's a lot of mileage and it's expensive to cross that mileage. Um, and I, you know, I don't know where the interconnect points are on the Big Island, but it strikes me that if you wanna, if you wanna cable this power from PGV to Kohala or something, it's a long way. <clears throat> so, if just assume for a moment with me that that um, you know the people at HNEI or otherwise can develop a real good system for putting the for generating the electricity with the electrolyzer at a, a, a geothermal plant, and then putting it in a tank like that as hydrogen, and then putting it on a truck. I mean, a, a tank, say say a liquid as a liquid, which would you get more on the truck that way. That's right. And you, and you send that truck to Kohala and you put it, you know, in the backyard behind some utility facility that, uh, that takes the hydrogen and generates electricity out of it. You're probably saving money because you don't have any degradation over that long line. You don't have to worry about the long building or main, maintaining the long line. Um, and I would imagine that to, to take the, the hydrogen out of the tank and turn it into electricity right now, dispatchable electricity in the remote location um, is most efficient if you just take the tank. And, th and this would be the technology, the best practices developed for say exporting it from Pune to mm, Oahu use the same best practices and export it anywhere, anywhere in the islands, at least. Um, wouldn't that be better than trying to build cables? You know, what, one thing that uh, to, to consider is electrolyzing. All you need is water and electricity. And the way it's set up right now, you know, when we, uh, Sustainable Energy Hawaii entered the docket, uh, the PGV, uh, uh, power purchase agreement, that docket in this uh, year ago, uh, January, we, we asked them to look into a competitive hydrogen rate and we suggested 10 cents a kilowatt hour as a nozzle. 
which, which means it needs to be a little bit less, but, but nevertheless. So we set that up as, as a thought. And the reason why is because if you could do something like that, every house could have an electrolyzer if the technology was developed to, to do it. I, I don't know if the economics work everywhere, but it gives us Hawaii, Hawaii Island uh, people an opportunity to participate in hydrogen, the, the new economy, right down to the house scale. Well, not only that, but uh, hydrogen can be used for cooking. Uh, we saw a demonstration of that on Stan's show this week with Paul Pontia, uh, where he had a, some kind of device he built himself to use hydrogen for cooking, believe it or not. Uh, anyway, we're out of time. I am sorry. Maybe this is a conversation that needs to happen again. So, uh, Mitch, can you summarize and, and give Richard a big thank you um, and close for me, please? Sure. So we've been uh, delighted to have Richard Ha from the Big Island, a geothermal supporter extraordinaire who's been giving us his thoughts on uh, geothermal power as well as just uh, living life and planning for the future, taking a long-term view rather, rather than the short-term view. So uh, it's been an interesting conversation and we've looked at uh, you know, several ideas. And so thank you, Richard, for stimulating our imagination and uh, supporting and all the support you give for people like us and, and your friends uh, to support these kinds of uh, ideas and, and thinking. Yeah. Well, like I said, yeah, it's not that complicated. Yeah, it's kind of, kind of common sense here. Yeah. yeah, common sense. But, uh, you know, it does take a little vision on top of the common sense, Richard, which is why we, we like to talk to you. Thank right. you very much for coming around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>